Water quality, when we talk about water quality, the, the most important thing to think about with water quality is a term called alkalinity. And alkalinity is different than what a lot of people think about when they think about water thing. The first thing they think about is water hardness. Now water hardness and water alkalinity are related, but hardness is actually a function of how much calcium carbonate mag is in the system or magnesium carbonate is in the system. And it's important to a homeowner in how hard it is to clean the toilet or how much corrosion you're going to get on your materials. Whereas alkalinity refers to how the plant is going to grow in that water. And the, when you're looking at alkalinity, the first thing you need to know is that alkalinity refers primarily to the amounts of carbonates and bicarbonates in the system. But carbonates and bicarbonates are anions, negative charges. And life is balanced in chemistry. And you have to have a cation to go along with that. So it's important that you evaluate what is the cation that's important. Where is it coming from in that water? Is it calcium? Is it magnesium? Or is it sodium? Those are the primary three that we're going to deal, be dealing about. Calcium and magnesium are what kinds of elements? They are essential elements. They are secondary macro. So they're essential for plant growth. Sodium, on the other hand, what does sodium have to do with plant growth? Depends on the plant species. Absolutely nothing. It is not an essential element. I thought it can um, replace potassium in some plants. It can replace potassium in all plants, except sodium actually is a different molecule and it disrupts the osmotic balance because sodium is such a bigger molecule, such has a higher activity than potassium that it tends to be toxic to plants. Some plants can tolerate higher levels of sodium than others. Now you'll hear people talking about the pH of their water and quite frankly I really don't care what the pH of my water is. I want to focus what the alkalinity is. Now the pH is linked to the alkalinity. The higher the alkalinity, typically the pH is higher, but the alkalinity is more important than the pH alone. When you're looking at water quality, you need to think about what else is in the water. Boron, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, sodium, chloride, chlorine, Fluoride, fluorine. What else is in the water is important to your plant production, especially when you're looking at potential toxicities. And certain crops respond to certain elements in different ways. So the most important thing to do with your water quality, or your water, when you're looking at your water quality, is to first regularly get a water sample test your water on a regular basis with a commercial agricultural lab. If you were to send your water sample off to a county health department, you're going to get how many fecal coliforms are in the water, you're going to get um, what the uh, hardness value is, what the pH value is, and all that kind of good stuff. Maybe total dissolved solids, but it's going to tell you diddly squat as far as agricultural. You need to send it to an agricultural test lab to get the exact numbers that you need. Now, I'm not saying that fecal coliforms in your water is not important because if your employees are drinking it, you need to know that. But for plant growth, you really need to assess and you also need to regularly assess how your media is responding to that water. So low alkaline water um, is ideal and this is what we have in Fort Collins, for instance, and most of the surface runoff on the eastern front of the Rockies is very low alkaline water. If you have low alkaline water, you're not having to use acidifiers or you're not going to use a, an acidifying fertilizer. To stabilize the pH, it's a little more challenging because there's no buffering in the water. 
Uh, you're going to have to supply calcium and magnesium because the low alkalinity means that you don't have those cations. It means we're going to have to fertilize with calcium and magnesium, perhaps, with low alkaline water. And it's important that you monitor the nutrients through your media constantly because low alkaline water has a tendency to leach nutrients fairly quickly. Remember, it has a low buffering capacity. So it's important to monitor your nutrients of your media on a regular basis. pH. Monitor your pH of your water constantly. Now, one of the issues that we find in the Front Range, especially in Denver water, is that Denver water has many, many reservoirs that they tap into to bring in the surface water into the city of Denver. As a consequence, many of those reservoirs have different parent material surrounding for the runoff, so the water chemistry is different. Are they going to tell the greenhouse growers on a regular basis which reservoir they're pulling their water from? Absolutely not. They're not going to do that. So you have to test the water constantly. Whereas in Fort Collins, the water supply is very, very constant. Typically comes out of the Poudre River, except for this summer. They swapped, switched out of the Poudre River in Fort Collins to the Horsetooth Reservoir. Horsetooth Reservoir is not normally a water supply for the city of Fort Collins. Why did we switch? Fire. Because of the fire runoff. And actually last week they just switched back to the Poudre River. So, yes? How does the wa water quality compare to Horsetooth versus the river? The water quality, well first of all, the water from Horsetooth Reservoir originated where? Do you know? Who knows where the water came from in Horseshoe's Reservoir? Leadville. No, I'm just kidding. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually not as far off as you think. I know it's up there somewhere. I just I really don't know where. Is it Western Slope or Eastern Slope water? Western. It's Western Slope water. It's pumped through the mountain. It actually comes from Lake Granby, which is the headwaters of the Colorado. So we stole water from Los Angeles. What's that? <laughs> so they're kind of stealing it from us, don't you think? We're closer. Yeah, well, water rights in, water rights in, the, in the West are very unique. So you need to cha check that. And so uh, the water quality is probably about the same. But if you go down, if you measure the water quality in the Colorado River, in Glenwood Springs compared to the water quality in Colorado Creek up in Jackson County. Very different. A lot more salts, a lot more selenium, a lot more boron, and it's very different. So, High alkaline water is a bigger challenge to worry about. Now where we see high alkaline water in Colorado, like the Western Slope, or from some of the wells that we have, the, low, the shallow wells. Does anybody know what the water table here in where we're sitting on CSU campus is? How deep the water table is? 20. How much? 20. 20, if we're lucky. Actually, at Summit Hall, when they built that building, they have to constantly pump water to keep the basement from flooding. The water table here is very high. Water table is very high um, because well, there is a lot of water. But if we were to tap that water table, it, because it's so close to the surface, there's a lot of alkalinity in it. So we see a lot of that alkaline water in Weld County and in Adams County, Colorado, where they're pumping out of shallow wells. So we have to use fertilizers more acidic. We're typically going to constant liquid feed. Because it's got alkalinity, it's a little bit more buffered and the pH doesn't swing as much, but we need to get the alkalinity out. And to get the alkalinity out of the water, we inject acid. When we start with alkaline water, alkaline water, every time it, the, the water precipitates the alkalinity into the potting soil, the pH is going to go up. It's just like adding dolomitic limestone. Calcium and magnesium carbonate, bicarbonate. Sodium, carbonate, bicarbonate. So the pH is going to constantly climb. So we start with a lower pH of our potting soil. 
And it's important, especially if the alkalinity is related to sodium. That's called the sodium absorption ratio. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. later. So it's important to monitor the sodium levels. And um, for those of you that have water softeners at home, we have hard water. A water softener does what to make the water soft? It doesn't precipitate anything out. What it does? Cation exchange. exchange. And what it does is it swaps the calcium and magnesium for sodium. So, uh, for instance, high sodium water, so water with a little more sodium in it, uh, it lathers up better, washes clothes cleaner. Um, people have a tendency to like it. It feels better in the shower and stuff like that. And um, they're they have water softeners in Colorado, usually. Hmm? What's that? Uh, they, a lot of people put water softeners in on their homes where they have high carbonate levels in their water, like where they have wells and such as that. But it really tears up the septic drain systems and stuff like that. Would that also change the pH of the water? It does raise the pH. It can raise the pH a little bit. So when we're looking at water and how it works with uh, fertilizers, the first thing you need to look at is evaluate the plant that you're working with because the plant type is going to generate what your fertilizer rate is when you're looking at your water system. The stage of plant growth you're, you're focusing on and how often you're going to apply your fertilizers, what your potting soil is, how much do you leach with every application or using a sub-irrigation system or a uh, surface irrigation system. Or if you're using, if you're blending a fertilizer in, and CRF refers to constant re uh, release fertilizers like Osmocote, Polyon, slow release products and stuff like that. The nutrient balance, of course, is crop dependent. Um, most ratios are 212, 313, 414. That's N to P205 to K2O. And we did talk about some crops the other day that have some different ratios. Uh, calcium to magnesium, typically two to one, three to one. Iron to manganese, two to one to three to one. And reason why I'm putting these numbers in front of you is to sink in the, the, the thoughts that when you're designing your fertilizer system, you have to look at the crop. You have to look at your media, look at your fertilization practices, and also you need to think about what is your water. If you're fertilizing with water that's got a lot of these things in it, you need to take advantage of it. You don't want to mix up your plants too much. Think about the pH of your potting soil. Are you using peat moss? What kind of peat moss you're using? What kind of peat you're using? Are you using bark, pine bark, hardwood bark, core, which is uh, coconut fiber? How much limestone? Your buffering of your irrigation water and how everything how you're sampling for your media pH. Now, I, those of you who had soils have seen this graph before. I mean, this graph has been around for decades. And this refers to a pH of four to a pH of eight. And this is the, the general range of most native soils. And it's also the general range of most plants. Plants have evolved around the, the, the generic uh, pH ranges where soils are. And you'll notice that at high pHs, pHs above 7, you'll see that a lot of our micro elements are, are, uh, are, have a tendency to be lowly of, slowly of, or not so available. Calcium and magnesium are highly available. Whereas you get down the pH to lower, uh, you'll see that the availability changes. And plants have evolved basically right where most of the nutrients are readily available. So when we're looking at the pH of our mix, the fertilizer is going to adapt it. How much fertilizer we're using, the crop you're growing. For instance, geraniums actually ex are proton excretors, so they change the pH of their fertilizer of their potting soil themselves. Some plants actually modify it. 
And you need to look at how things change over time. So this is a, a graph that demonstrates how the pH changes in your pot when you apply limestone. Now it's not going to be quickly available. Remember limestone is ground up rock. Ground up rock. So you can't, it's not going to be effective right away. So if you put limestone in it, measure the soil pH, and you say, I didn't change anything. Well, duh, you didn't change anything because it hasn't incorporated into the system. It has to have time. So a lot of times we tell our growers, wait a week or two before you actually look at your pH of your potting soil. Get, a, get an idea of what things are going on. Crop considerations of pH, uh, poinsettias, and we'll talk about these in more detail when we talk about the individual crops. pH 5.8 to 6.2. You'll see that most of these are fairly a, a little on the acidic side. So we want low boron levels, but we need higher molybdenum and zinc. So if we get high boron levels in our water, we need to think about maybe pulling the boron off because poinsettias are actually susceptible to boron toxicity. Yes? Uh, it's not like a direct question, but if you never have grown a crop before, and, and besides going off previous literature, how would you decide where to start with certain ratios of fertilizers for the specific crop you're growing? You shoot with the standards to begin with, or look at similar plants, plants that you're dealing with that come from similar ecological backgrounds, mm -hmm. similar areas, look at the environment that the plant uh, adapted from, and you can typically find a correlation somewhere. Exactly. Okay. Poinsettias, for instance, also have dark leaf and green leaf fertilizers. And actually, the dark leaf fertilizers require less fertilizer. So if you have a dark leaf fertilizer and a green leaf fertilizer, you're going to put them in different feeds because you can't feed them all the same uh, or the quality will turn out different. And these are the old recommendations to feed. And we're feeding actually at lower concentrations today. Chrysanthemum, the same pH range. Iron and manganese toxicity is, ob is, is common. So you're not going to put it on the same feed of a crop that requires uh, higher iron and manganese. You know, like, for instance, you're not going to put this on the same feed with azaleas. And it's also very species specific and cultivar specific. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of cultivars of mums and you need to choose what's based upon your system. Crops like pansies, vinca, salvia, snapdragons, uh, they need to have be grown at a pH less than six. Otherwise, these iron and manganese becomes less available. Remember that big chart? And they become deficient. So a lot of times in some of these crops like this, we'll have to add trace elements with a chelate to protect it from higher pH. And this these crops actually require boron. Seeds and cutting geraniums, you run into problems. And where do you get this information? You read about your crop, you know what your nutrient levels are, and a lot of this just comes from experience. And when people send me samples, I ask them, what's the water? What's the water test? What's your soil? What's your soil test? What crop are you growing? And until they give me that information, I can't help them figure out what their problems are. New Guinea impatiens. So this, for instance, is a crop that we don't want to start feeding too hard. But as it adapts, pentas, 6.8, and so forth. So I like to think of my pH neutral point as 6. Now that's not what the chemist use. What does the chemist use? They use 7. Okay. If it's above six, I consider that to be a fairly alkaline plant. If it's below six, I consider that to be an acidic plant. 
and that's kind of a generic thing for crops. Above pH 6, we're going to grow crops like African ma marigolds and zonal geraniums. Think about where those crops are native. These are plants that are probably from more Mediterranean, more Sub-Saharan, more Central Mexico. You would typically think of those being somewhat of an alkaline environment. Below six, ivy geraniums, pansies, vincas, salvia. These are from cooler, more temperate parts of the world. So you're going to think of them to be more acidic. Plants that lower the pH, tomatoes. Why would a tomato lower the pH of its potting soil? Actually, I've seen examples of tomatoes lowering the pH of the hydroponic system to less than four. Why would a tomato lower the pH? Tomatoes are what we consider to be a heavy feeding crop. That means they're pulling lots of nitrogen out of the system and they love ammonium. So they're going to drive the pH down. Carnations are the same. Celosia, begonia, geranium. Plants that raise the pH, African marigolds, vinca, zinnia, no change, crops like pansy. So it's important to read the literature. And I believe I gave you this link in your reading assignments on Blackboard. Are you finding the reading assignments on Blackboard? Um, chemically, why does it raise the pH? Why does it raise the pH? Because it's excreting a hydroxyl group, preferentially. As it uptakes, it's pushing off more hydroxyl groups than hydrogen ions. Yes? So does it have to do with the plant's preference for cations versus anions? Plant's preference for cations versus anions. That's pretty anthropomorphic, yes, but they preferentially take it up, yes. So when you get your pH out of range, when you're out of range for that particular crop, you, what becomes toxic is iron, manganese, zinc, and copper. Calcium, magnesium is deficient. That's more sensitivity to nitrate, ammonium, and phosphates are leached. The pH is too high, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron become deficient. Also, cold soil creates these deficiencies as well. And we've already talked about ammonium ions. And here's another graphic from another. You can see this is where this happens, where when we're excreting off the different um, cations and anions, hydroxyl groups versus hydrogen groups, it's going to change the pH. So when we're looking at our fertilizers that we're going to choose, one of the things you'll hear about, and you'll talk about this in Sula's class, is the potential um, reaction of the mix. And it's most fertilizers are, are rated as acid or basic based upon how many pounds of calcium carbonate per ton of fertilizer it takes to neutralize them. So an acidic fertilizer like Maracid, which is 2177, that's almost pure ammonium, is it takes almost well, more than a t uh, like a three quarters of a ton of calcium carbonate to neutralize it. 201020, which is moderately acidic, uh, 397, all the way down to the CalMags, which these are the very basic fertilizers that a lot of growers will use to keep the pH of their soil from changing drastically over time. So last week we talked about chemigation or fertilization with injectors. Injectors to apply all these different products. 
And a lot of times we use the word fertigation to imply the use of fertilizer injectors in our water. And a farmer will use fertigation to be more convenient, get into the field when, he, when, he, when they can't put a, a tractor out there, less damage to roots. And we use it as a delivery mechanism because we have these individual little pots all over the greenhouse where it's difficult to put fertilizer in every single pot. I can tell you I've been to nurseries in, so, in, in the southern United States and the Gulf, Gulf states where they've got a man go, or a woman going around with a teaspoon flipping fertilizer in each container. Can you imagine what that costs? Even if that person is making the lowest salary on the property, that's still costing a lot. It's easier to apply the monitor, monitor the nutrients we're putting direct, directly in the plant. We get an even distribution. We can incrementally apply it and we can change it and get in there anytime we want. Injectors, um, depending on the product you're applying, um, might require agitation. This is a, a, a fertilizer tank in a large tomato operation where to keep this material agitated, they've actually got a, um, a little half horse electric motor with a paint paddle on it runs constantly to keep material in solution so it doesn't precipitate out depending on what they're working with. Injectors come in different shapes and sizes, um, mixing tanks. Uh, chemical injectors like you would use for acid require special dosing pumps. Um, you need to look at the ha hazardous nature of the material. Uh, the fertilizer is safe to handle. This is an acid pump, dosing pump here on top of this yellow tank. The yellow tank is the acid chamber itself. This particular device is designed specifically for sulfuric acid. And here's another picture of your dosing pump. Some injectors require power. Uh, a lot of injectors are powered by um, the water motor itself in the injector. Some injectors require uh, current. Do you have access to power? Most greenhouses have power some kind. This is the uh, Smith injector system. Um, portable versus um, permanent. The, all the way down to the Venturi systems which are very uh, simple. No moving parts. They're cheap. Um, the siphon hose typically 16 to 1 or 12 to 1. And here's some more pictures of a siphon hose. A lot of people use these for pesticides as well. However, because once you use a, a fertilizer injector for a pesticide, it's now a pesticide application equipment. That includes the hose and the nozzle. The uh, bladder design, the Venturi bladders, uh, self-contained. Um, they have less pressure loss. Uh, showed you a picture the other day. It's just another diagram where you have fertilizer, the pressure pushes it up in the proportioning head. They're portable. This is the Giwa. This is another brand, the MP proportioner. Um, this is actually the, the culprit when I described getting hit in the face with blue water. This is the particular one that I was using at that particular time. Um, they do make a mess. Positive displacement, cast, pol polymer, the uh, Anderson injectors, which require power. Um, they're um, a modular injection system that you can put a device into. Multiple injection technologies for blending. Um, you can also uh, use different kinds of systems where you can actually mount the injector on, for instance, a boom irrigation system. Um, this photograph is very difficult to see, but there's an injector head mounted up on the boom, right in the center of the boom, above the spray heads, where um, this particular grower adapts it to most systems. Uh, integrating your injection system with your irrigation network is simple. Um, you need to think about filtration. And water quality 
is also the, the how much uh, sediment you have in your water. For instance, if you're using a surface water source, for example, in this particular nursery, they collect all the runoff and reuse the water constantly. So they're having to filter it on a regular basis. Um, has suspended solids. All water has some suspended solids in it. Uh, ditch water, recycled water can have higher levels. You can use a mesh screen. Um, this is a little filter that is uh, mounted on this particular one. It's mounted on a uh, pad cooling system. And a lot of people use the clear so they can see how much sediment is grabbing up in there. But one of the things you need to watch is, is because it's clear, it's going to grow algae on the inside as well. So you need to think about that. Um, I would prefer using a, a darker one, but the clearer you can actually see what's going on. This is a back flushing system I showed you last week. Here's a very simple uh, filtration system. This is called a cascading filter, where it's got little needles sticking up and the water actually cascades across the sheet. You can see where there's a little arch of debris collecting towards the bottom of the cascading filter. And what's, easy, what's great about this particular filter is to clean it, they just take a little pass, a little comb, and scoop the junk off. This particular one is used in a uh, ebb and flood floor irrigation system. And you can see the size of the water trough fertilizer tanks, the vaults of water behind it. Backflow wellhead protection is important. This is a greenhouse outside of uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, where they have a, a water well. And you notice that the water well, the electric pump, is actually sitting on a piece of concrete about six inches above the grade. And that's required by law to prevent any backflow from contaminating that well. Um, and there also, before it goes into this expansion pressure chamber, there's a backflow prevention that elim eliminates the problem of any nutrients or fertilizers getting back into the system. And they're very important to put these on backflow prevention systems on domestic water supplies. Showed you this graph before. What we haven't talked about, except just mentioning it, is acidification. And we acidify our water to remove the amount of bicarbonates and carbonates in the water. We don't do this to acidify our soil, our potting soil. What we do is we eliminate the carbonates and bicarbonates which will accumulate in the potting soil which will raise the pH. Okay, we don't acidify the water to raise the pH of our potting soil. So we inject an acid into the system to neutralize the alkalinity. And the offshoot is carbon dioxide and water. All right. So if we have carbonates and bicarbonates in our water, we introduce a hydrogen ion into the water from an acid mixes with the carbonates and bicarbonates in the water, and we get CO2 and water as an offshoot. We're not changing the pH. We're eliminating the carbonates. Okay, It's important that you remember this. Talk to growers all the time. Well, I've acidified my so water, so my pH of my soil isn't changing. So what it does is it reduces it. Now the acids that we commonly use in a system like this are sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is probably the most economical. Nitric acid. Nitric acid is fairly inexpensive, but it's typically called a fuming acid, so it's not as easy to handle. Phosphoric acid is probably the most expensive. What would be a benefit of using phosphoric acid, though? Additional phosphate supply. It's adding phosphate to the system. However, if you have to add so much, it might upset your balance. Citric acid. Why would we use citric acid in the system? 
It's organic. Why is it considered organic? Because it's carbon. Because it's carbon. What if the citric acid is not an organic citric acid form? Exactly. Who cares? Omri doesn't care. They actually just came out with a study of the FDA. It was like a 10 year study, and I think it's going to make the organic department lose, uh, I think, $30 billion annually because they came out and there's no nutritional difference between organic grown produce and uh, conventionally grown produce. Literally, no, like, the dif like, maybe a difference in taste, but the actual nutritional value of the food. I'll find that report for you guys. What, what, did you hear what, what Matthew said about organic agriculture? No nutritional benefit. It's all. What division of USDA does organic certification reside? The marketing division. There's no science. Sorry. So, which acid do you choose? You want to consider. How much, how hard it is, how safe is it, how easy is it to use? If you're using sulfuric acid, uh, if you're getting 95% balmay sulfuric acid, which is the cheapest, you have to have specialized clothing to handle it. You have to have shields. You've got to have chain link fence. You've got to like to have a lot of different stuff, but it's the cheapest. How hard is it to get to? Are you going to add uh, some nutrients? If you're using sulfuric, you're giving a little sulfur. Using phosphorus, you're giving a little phosphate. If you're using nitrate, you're actually giving a little nitrogen. How available is it to you to buy? Now, on the front range of Colorado, I can pick up the phone. I can call um, a chemical supply company, and I can have a 55-gallon drum of sulfuric acid on my property in 24 hours. However, if you're off in the mountains somewhere, it might not be so easy to get. What's the easiest form of acid to get anywhere in the country? Any guess? If I told you to, to buy sulfuric acid and then you're in the middle of Wyoming and you wanted to buy it this afternoon, where are you going to go? Grocery store. Where? The grocery store. the grocery store for sulfuric acid? No. no. Where do we use sulfuric acid more than any place else in this country? Batteries. In car batteries. So you're going to go to the AutoZone store or the Napa store or something like that when they're everywhere and you can get sulfuric acid there and it's 35%. It's still pretty darn caustic, but... Isn't that, hmm? Isn't that really dangerous? Oh, it is very dangerous. <laughs> but... 60 it's a lot safer than 67% nitric acid because it's a fuming acid. All acids are dangerous. Nitric acid, like I said, fumer. You need protective clothing, eyewear, gloves and aprons, so forth. What's it cost? Sulfuric and nitric are cheaper than phosphoric and citric. Citric is actually the most expensive. Phosphoric is typically a food grade acid. It's pretty expensive. Um, citric is considered cost prohibitive unless you want to be organic then it's not that bloody expensive and of course availability in shipping and what nutrients that you're going to get from your acids themselves and in fact I've worked with growers that use a lot of citric acid citric acid uh, in large drums is actually quite easy to get a hold of and, or you can just get bags of food grade citric acid and food grade citric acid is considered to be uh, when you introduce it to the water organic so in citric acid not as effective at neutralizing the carbonates and it is not as effective as neutralizing carbonates and bicarbonates because it's not doesn't have the um, who's taking chemistry right now what would you what, what do, when they talk about different acids they talk about the acid dissociation constant Exactly. Yeah. I took freshman chemistry when I was a freshman. 1973. <laughs> so, another thing is some of our acids react with pesticides. Uh, in fact, if you have high alkaline water 
Some pesticides are more effective if we drop the pH. A lot of people would use phosphoric acid. But those pesticides that are, are primarily organophosphates, and we don't use too many organophosphates in greenhouses anymore. So, uh, 